It's in a mile, probably oh, three quarters of a mile loop. And you can do it in either direction, but I'm going to have us um, head down the road and around. So we'll do the longest part of the loop before we get to Margaret's Rock. And, and I think the way we'll do it, um, I'll stop every so often. Um, but if you've got questions, just walk along with me and we can talk about some of those on the way. Does the town do No, we do the maintenance. Uh, yeah, plowing. This is a squash field or a vegetable field that um, Four Town Farm is using. And this year, for a variety of reasons, they decided not to do anything with it. So it's just uh, winter rye that's obviously gone to seed. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they're going to try to plant anything late summer, early fall or not. Probably not this year. But, uh, not past, but, um, and this is the power line that goes down to Fall River. Um, <clears throat> used to connect to the big uh, coolers they had that they took down right. over there. Yeah, yeah. Mm. That's a little out of the scope of uh, the visit to Margaret's Rock, but this field we're going to be going through is um, an example of what happens when farmland is left unused. And this has only been uh, left alone for two seasons now. This is the third season, and you can see how rapidly it's growing in. Um, all of this was open on the sides. Um, but how do you keep it? You got to mow it. Well, that that becomes the question. Um, mm. That's really, it's going to be shrubs and trees in ten years. And how do you prevent that? And part of the answer seems to be the kind of um, animal life that you encourage that would eat that or Cattle. prevent it or cattle or goats or deer, different things, yeah. Uh. yeah so. <laughs> Lovely little spot. Yeah, I came out just to cut a little bit of the brush back and uh, just in the last week this um, little sign uh, had come loose from the post that it's on. So um, it's been here probably six or seven years and I think just uh, glued in place and the glue let go. I think this moisture had something to do with it. It's one of those sites that is uh, sort of been validated I guess would be a good word as a a seasonal camp for the Poconocket and by validated I mean that when Dave and I have been out with other groups we've been joined on several occasions by members of the um, Poconocket tribe from today including their tribal historian and this seems to them a place that was um, very likely. We've also <clears throat> had a, um, another historian um, you might be really interested with the uh, research that you're doing, but a guy named Jamie Warren, James Warren, who's mostly a military historian, uh, but very interested in the uh, colonial period in particular. And he wrote a really wonderful book about um, Roger Williams and um, Narragansett, Poconocket, and what was happening at sort of just contact to the next 50 years. And uh, when Jamie was out, um, one of the things we talked about, we'll take a little stroll in a few minutes up alongside of this rock. Um, there's a big, long, flat bench that is probably where the seasonal village was. And it was likely um, a winter village and probably, uh, most likely winter because in the summer you'd be down by the water, it'd be, you know, closer to the seasonal food. But up here, this is an incredibly well-protected place from the winter, and you still have access to all the kinds of resources you'd want for a camp. And it's big enough to um, easily uh, manage the size of the band that would have been here. Probably 200 people or less mm -hmm. would have been most likely. Um, 200. 200, yeah. So the other, the other couple of things, um, one fact about the um, people who had lived here and then just a little bit about the geology, natural history. Um, uh, the thing that really um, gives me pause for reflection every time I come out here is to imagine that this place was continuously inhabited you know, by people that moved from site to site in the area. 
uh, for somewhere between eight and 10,000 years. So, you know, you think of this right now, this is kind of a nice natural environment. It's like going out and like this was home and it was intensely used and lived in continuously, sustainably for eight to 10,000 years. And um, that has, there's a lot of implications for that. The natural history of this area a little bit, and I know um, Tim with uh, his camera here has been doing some research on this as well, he and his wife Sarah. Um, there are these spines of rock, so what you're seeing right now is an outcropping that is the terminus of an above ground spine of rock that runs about a mile, half a mile, um, north and south. And if you go over a quarter of a mile um, in either direction, you're going to come across other spines of rock. And these are the consequence of the glaciers that mm -hmm. were here about 10,000, 12,000 years ago. And they are metamorphic rock, which means they took a lot of mud and junk and compressed it under intense pressure into a pretty firm rock. So um, a lot of the way the um, water moves in this area, a lot of the different little microclimates um, are determined really by these spines of rock that run, you know, 10 miles or so um, north and south. Things is that the spines actually are serpentine. They go in and out of the ground. So this is where this one actually is coming down. And I imagine at one point this came out further and probably sloped down like to about right where I'm standing right now. Um, <coughs> goes underground for some period and then pops back up. And they sort of alternate. So where this one is underground, the one next to us is above ground. So we walk, I don't know if you noticed it, but we walk past, uh, we have, actually we have not we came in this way. We'll walk past another one on the way out that you'll see, see what I'm talking about. So that really um, is what gives this area um, its geological, natural history characteristics. It makes for great windbreaks. It really, you know, you can find a lot of dry spots. But also because of the glaciers, um, the land itself, the earth itself around here has a nice layer of topsoil. And then some places it's all sand and gravel. There actually was a gravel pit just not too far from here for years. Um, but a lot of places, like um, my house, we walk by most of our yard. Actually, if you go down a foot of beautiful topsoil, you run into about two or three inches of clay. And what that means for right now, like a wet season like this, is the ground saturates. Mm -hmm. And then every time we get a rain, you can actually see the rain move across the surface of our lawn for an hour or two. It's pretty spooky. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of really funky little um, geologies around here that mean what grows can vary a lot, but also that the more you know it, um, the more you get the sense of how these little tiny pieces of land work or could work what they could do. And so the kind of, um, some of you might know the um, farmer writer uh, Wendell Berry, but he makes a claim in one of his books that um, for a small scale local uh, farmer, with a farm of about 120 acres, which is sort of similar to what we've got here, it can take up to three generations at a minimum to learn how to use it really, really efficiently, really effectively. So I think about like, what would you learn in 8,000 years about how to use this place? It would be pretty amazing and then pass all that on, right? So, so think about all that just kind of as a little background context. The story itself, which I'm guessing most of you are already familiar with, is that in the winter of 1636, Roger Williams is chased out of um, the North Shore of what's now the North Shore of Massachusetts, um, just ahead of um, some of the Puritans who were interested in, um, I don't know if they would have arrested him or just you know harassed him or what, but he was scared enough that he left and left behind his wife and children and made his way down here in what was apparently a snowy, cold winter. Um, arrived end of January, early February, depending which version of the calendar you're, using, you know, you're thinking about. Um, when he got here, he was ill, 
and uh, the best guess is that it was probably pneumonia, turned into pneumonia, and he stayed here for a monthish, maybe more, maybe a little less, and was nursed back to health by the Poconaca band that was wintering here. Um, some of his crew met him here, and he made his way down to what's now Providence and started that chapter in his life, you know, sort of establishing Providence. Um, that's got its own history, which I know a little bit about, but I'm, I would not claim to be any, any expert with. Um, <clears throat> so the one thought is that uh, the spot that he was actually in physically while he was being nursed back to health is this area of the rock, and it's not, it's very likely, there's no proof one way or the other, um, <clears throat> but the reason for that would be, um, I've been out here 365 days a year, literally, for at least the last eight years, and there is never any weather inside of that little heat. Like it can be, there's no snow, we've had three or three feet of snow, no snow in there. Um, you get a big north uh, Wester and Northeast are coming in. They're coming in from over there. This is protect. You get something coming from the Southwest. This little bit of rise in the other ridge stop most of the weather. So there's all this is really protected mm. and in the middle of the winter uh, The sun you can see it's kind of right here right now, but it's going to move and it'll be right in there, especially if you take down a little bit of the brush um, Put in a fire um, right about where that little fire pit it's some uh, local teenagers put in a couple of years ago um, and you can heat up the rocks and um, once the rocks themselves are warm put a little lean-to over that and you can have a pretty cozy especially if it came out another say three or four feet you know. so that's that's one theory one idea that I personally like a lot so I choose to believe that it's true but I have like zero evidence for it um, when the tribal historian was out um, they agreed that you know that was a credible possibility. Um, just as likely is that um, there on this bench that we'll go visit, there would have been the Witus, the little uh, you know, wood structures, the housing um, that multiple families would have lived in. And it's just as likely that Roger Williams was inside one of those and that's where he was kept. My, one of my initial questions when I was starting to really explore this was to, um, to wonder about two things. One is, like, what would it mean to a band of 200 people living um, as basically small farming, hunter-gatherer, and have somebody appear on your doorstep who's sick and make a big demand on your winter resources. So you've put aside enough of everything to get through the winter. It's a cold, long winter, colder than usual, more snow than usual, hunting's a little more difficult. What, why hospitality? And what kind of a demand did that put on the folks who were offering that hospitality? So it's a really generous act, it appears that on the face of it, right? So that was one thing I was curious about. And then uh, jumping forward 400 years, the other thing I was curious about is if um, the uh, Poconocan had to do it all over again, would they do the same thing? Because I think, I don't know, if I were them, I'd have some questions about how, how, how it went. But um, as I've learned more about the history and more about the circumstances, and there's a wonderful book, uh, a little aged right now, but by a colonial historian named Francis Jennings called um, Indians, uh, Colonials in the Cant of Conquest. And others since him have done more uh, digging around this, but it matters that Williams showed up in 1636 because he was walking into a really dynamic political context. And the political dynamism had uh, just a little bit arbitrary, but long history of um, tension, aggression between the Narragansett and the Poconocket. And the Poconocket are one of five bands of Indians in an alliance that goes from Martha's Vineyard, sort of north through what's now Massachusetts, kind of over to Deerfield and down to here. We're kind of at the southwest end of it. So 
total of 20 to 40,000 people, um, not huge um, demographically, but a big land area. But this long history of conflict with Narragansett, who are a powerful tribe with alliances going to the west and north, right? And, um, but to pick a date, sort of an arbitrary-ish kind of date, 1619, 1617, 1620, just about the time that the pilgrims are arriving in Plymouth, um, there's an epidemic of some sort that goes through this area. The Narragansett are largely untouched by it. This is kind of interesting to think about in the context of um, the pandemic now and the potential um, for what that could do. But the Poconocket, um, the estimates vary, and I think from what I can tell, most of the estimates are guesstimates, really much more. There's not really much empirical evidence other than um, stories and other parallel situations. But somewhere between 40 and 90% of the Poconocket living in this area um, were killed by this pandemic over a two or three year period. And that left them politically, not only socially, destroyed a lot of the culture. You know, imagine what it would be to be a child surviving that, right, for example. And you think about the impact of trauma on generational history. Um, so this huge, huge transformation happening, right? So that's part one. But part two is that all of a sudden they're politically incredibly vulnerable to the Narragansett pushing over from the West. So part of the reason that um, the, Ma the Massasoit Osamaquin um, reached out to the British settlers is he wanted to build alliances where they would agree to protect him if he were attacked by the Narragansett. So he was looking for some sort of detente in, in the region. And um, the event that uh, Dave hosted on July 3rd with the Soham's Heritage Group to mark the um, treaty that emerged out of that is partly because it was in everybody's interest to um, achieve that kind of detente. Work for the settlers, Narragansetts were okay with it for a little while, certainly worked to the advantage of the tribe, right? So that's one really important date, and I think in some ways almost more from a tribal history um, point of view, maybe a more significant date even than King Philip's War. Um, you know, some years later. So the other date that gets talked about a lot um, for a very good reason is King Philip's War, 1675. And again, some of you I'm sure are really familiar with the details of that conflict. But um, by 1675, this little trickle of settlers had become a stream and there was a lot of pressure around um, land. And what the Poconocket had to keep doing was allowing more settlers to take more land in order to maintain these alliances that they had become dependent on. The settlers um, who had not come up with that original agreement were um, a little more aggressive and greedy in their demands, and it started to destabilize a lot of the relationships um, that all that this depended on with a tribe that was continuing um, to be pretty pretty weak because of the aftermath of that um, epidemic. And um, <clears throat> details are um, disputed or debated, but um, kind of who started it, um, you know, the native folks or the settlers, but long story short, there was a, um, a hanging of a native man that became the um, catalyst for a conflict. And Usama Quinn's son, Metacomet, um, Metacomet Avenue, some of you have come down mm -hmm. and right, a lot of, um, so he was a lot less patient than his father and he had a different view of how history was unfolding. And he believed that they had come to, the tribe had come to a moment where if they didn't drive out the settlers, they were just going to be overwhelmed by them. And it was really literally a, the survival of the tribe that he thought was, and of the, their people as a whole, that was at stake. So he um, started a conflict. It parts started right in this area, spread out to Deerfield, spread you know north and east, um, and um, 
short version of it is that the native communities lost badly by the end of it. And um, the result for the Poconocket was that um, probably 40% of their adult population was killed in the war. So another huge loss on the heels of an initial loss. And um, they were pretty much um, taken prisoner or escaped to what's now southern Maine and uh, lived with uh, the Passamaquoddy tribe. So a lot of the uh, Poconocket culture sort of visually, culturally just disappeared from the landscape. Um, and laws were passed that made it illegal to speak the language, practice any of the customs, and those laws were not repealed until the 1940s. Wow. So, yeah, this is not, this is not ancient history, right? <laughs> So part of um, the dynamic that's happening in the present day, some of you were talking about the dispute that the Poconocket are currently having with Brown University. Really, really complicated, and the uh, tribal representatives are very circumspect about it because it's so delicate in so many ways. So this is me speaking, not them speaking. I want to be real clear. But my take on it is that um, the tribe needs federal recognition in order to have any legal standing to pursue anything. Because of the history I just described, it has literally been erased from the history books. It's only now starting to reappear. We can either just take a little stroll up and take a look at the bench, or we can just talk, um, answer any questions you've got. Uh, one of my motivations for doing a lot of these visits with folks is I have not been out here yet with a group where somebody hasn't known a lot more about something than I do, and I get to listen to their stories or hear their ideas, and um, if you've just got things to add, uh, I'm all ears. Like, I would just love to hear whatever you all have to throw in the pot. Like, that's probably the most fun thing. Um, I just have a question. Yeah. Um, you said that there were laws passed. What year were the laws passed for the uh, Pretty much on the heels of uh, the um, King Phillips War. Mm -hmm. About the uh, connection with this community here in Mount Hope in Bristol, was it the same? Both Poconocket, yeah. And, and who was the leader of, was uh, Metacomet, uh, King Philip, the, the leader of both areas? He, well, his father would have been. And then he, well, Massasoit's actually like chief. It, um, so it's a title, and uh, the person we call Massasoit in the history books is actually, his name is Osama Quinn. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, this isn't the only spot in this area. <clears throat> um, just across the other side of 136, almost due west from here, another long uh, little bit of ridge that is right next to um, Johnson's Market, the food stand over there. Oh, yes. Yeah. And that's apparently, the stories are, that's where corn was ground. Um, so you can go in and find ridges in that rock that look like they would have worked with a mm. pestle to a mortar and pestle. Um, there's a large, we won't go to it today, but on the other side of the farm here, there is a large erratic boulder that's tall as me and you know twice as wide um, that the story is that that's where the Poconoke women went to give birth, mm. and it probably looked different. I'm sure it was more um, forested. Right now, it's in the middle of a farm field, but um, you know, it's it's sort of a, a space with some sort of um, energy to it that made it a propitious space place to go to do that. So you know. So the other thing I personally am really um, fascinated with, and not only in this place, but other stories, but um, one of the reasons I really love living here is I do think if you can um, pay enough attention to um, nat natural environments and see how we're connected to them, you can really begin to understand why some places are really powerful and others are not or the, and um, you know for myself um, and maybe it's just a you know overactive imagination but I, I don't think so but I think this is one of those really really powerful spots partly because of the history and knowing it but just um, there's just a vibe that comes off of this piece of land um, so you're saying that 
soon mm. as you turn the corner and you see the path leading up to this. Yeah, this, this is, uh, you know, partly it's just beautiful and, you know, kind of fits a lot of the things we hope for going out for hikes and things, but, but there's a real kind of energy. And I think some of that is, um, you know, a little metaphysical, but that's, so imagine 8,000 years of people living and dying here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like just, it's here. And maybe, yeah. again, just maybe imagination, but maybe, maybe something more than that. So also a large hill that was probably a beacon hill of one kind or another. Um, for example, when the cooling towers came down in Fall River a couple of years ago, um, I went up and stood at the top of this hill and I could see the towers come down. Like I couldn't see the last 20 feet, but I saw the first 50 or 100 feet, like, you know. So it's, you get a pretty clear shot and the thought of those is that um, those were places, um, and it's a big pile of rubble, largely, so it was probably built intentionally over the years by the people who lived here. But it was used to do um, fire and smoke signal to other receiving and relaying mm -hmm. points up and down um, in this area. So they would pick the highest whatever um, or build up a highest area that had the best sight line and then use that to communicate really, you know, probably pretty basic kinds of information and then send runners out with more detail. Um, I think Mount Hope was one of those. Yeah, there's a, there's a hope. Yeah, because it was much higher than it is now. And to, and to Dave's point, once you start thinking that way, you can start looking at the connection between point and point and point and start really seeing the landscape in some different ways. So there's part of the fun of it is just you start looking at this and it's like, wow, this place looks so different than the way I imagined it five years ago, two years mm -hmm. ago. But this would have been the bench and um, the reason we think and that uh, Ruth Major who did the painting and the uh, tribal historian, Jamie Warren, a lot of folks have said this is a very plausible guess. Um, this bench, and by bench I mean it comes down, wide flat area, and then it drops off another, kind of where that tree is down, another 20 feet or so down to a main path that you can walk on through there. And this wide bench is protected from the northwest, which is where the worst storms would come from. Um, so you probably would um, get less snow, less weather coming through. Um, it's got really good drainage, pretty easy access to water sources. There's a, I'm sure they've moved over the years, but there's a lot of little springs and mm -hmm. you know Fresh ke water. kettle holes, um, yeah. kinds of things. Um, this, as Dave was saying, this probably would have all been burned off every year, every couple of years which means that the trees would be here, but the undergrowth would be pretty cleared out, uh, made hunting easier. Um, food supplies would have been um, kind of three sisters farming, which is corns, beans, and squash grown in hills together. There's mm -hmm. a... The three sisters. Yeah, the three sisters, they do. Um, from a sustainable agriculture point of view, it's a really good move because they actually feed, they feed each other, they support each other in a lot of ways, as well as physical structures do. But also, if you look at them from a nutrition point of view, they are probably one of the succotash that you can make from those three ingredients is one of the most complete um, nutritional sources you can find. So just a, so they would, and they're also storable. So you'd have fish, um, uh, local wildlife that you'd hunted, um, and then these stored, and you know, be able to have a pretty, pretty nice yeah, winter back here. Yeah. yeah, and probably the we twos would, I would guess, they would have been um, north south running. Maybe they would have faced to the east for the, you know, the opening beat to the east, um, and probably something you could live in for multiple seasons in a row before they had to be replaced. But, mm. And a group of maybe 200 people would come stay here for a part of the year and then move on somewhere else. Right. The need to have a main camp like this be in a defensible position. Mm -hmm. So part of the value of having this ridge here is not only that it protects against weather, but if you put a lookout up on that ridge, um, you're going to see anybody coming right, and get some advance. And it's easy to be up there, shoot down, and you know, right. arrows are very defensive protect. Yeah. But similarly, anybody trying to come up into your camp from the bottom of this bench would have to come uphill at you and put them at a significant um, 
tactical disadvantage. Hmm. So this, um, and the other reason is that path down there and really for the few days after a really bad weather event can get pretty sloppy. And up here, always nice and dry. This hmm. is, uh, you're still on a rock slab that drains really, really quickly. So, you know, what I'm projecting to a large degree, if I were going to put a camp in some place under those conditions, this is where I would choose. But that's, I don't, I honestly don't know how yeah, people had, living here thought about it. Yeah, we had a big thunderstorm it. yesterday and there's practically no water. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you won't, and you won't find any here. Yeah, you know, this they knew where to go. <laughs> Um, we're going to head down this path in just a minute, but I wanted to pause here because the folklore is that the burial site for the band that was here was right down in this little area that drops off in this little area. You can walk in there and see where you'll be walking along and all of a sudden it drops two or three feet. And if anybody had been buried there, if anything had been buried there that, was, um, that could decompose, that would explain why there is this sort of drop in the uh, um, topography. But um, there's been a couple of archaeological groups come in with ground uh, radar and some a little bit of digging around, and um, they haven't ever found any artifacts to suggest that there that is in fact the case. And to be honest, I think the preference is that there not be a lot of digging around because mm. the uh, what we'd be likely to learn from it is probably not worth the disruption of uh, you know, really meaningful burial ground. Um, from my point of view is um, indigenous people didn't have this idea of ownership in the same way. What they had was, I'm from here, so a lot of indigenous people, their tribal name means the first people. And they're not saying we're the only people or the source of all humans. We're the first people from this place. To see the light, right? And so we are what we eat. We are the generation. So there's this this idea, but they saw themselves as a part of a landscape, not as the owners of it, not even as the stewards of it, but as a part of it, right, in relationship with it. And what comes out of that is a concept of what, in a Western legal jargon, would be called usufruct rights. Mm -hmm. And usufruct rights are the right to use a dimension of a landscape. So. Me and my people have lived here for a thousand years, but I'm going to give you the right to tap the maple trees. Mm -hmm. You don't have the right to do anything else, but I'm going to, in return for something, I'm going to give, you know, I'm going to understand that you have the right, and maybe that becomes a tradition, and then you have that right sort of inherited from, you know, generation to generation. But a different, really different way to think about land um, is that it's not a single entity that people own, but it's a bundle of rights. Mm -hmm. And each of those rights can be independently mm -hmm. negotiated between you and the land and between you and other users. You have the right to come here and get blueberries, but you don't have the right to hunt deer. And so my guess is that a lot of times when European settlers, particularly initially, were coming out and saying, oh, I want to buy your land, I want, I want some land, what the natives probably thought they were saying is, we have a communal mm -hmm. mindset, mm -hmm. and you're part of the landscape now. We don't like you particularly, but you're mm -hmm. here. Um, you know, so yeah, we'll give you the right to hunt some deer. You, you've got the right to harvest these berries mm -hmm. or to set up a household, but it's a limited right. It's a very, it's a use. It's not an ownership. And there's, and my guess is that people like Roger Williams understood that difference. If he's going to write mm -hmm. the alphabet of the Algonquin speaking people, mm -hmm. chances are pretty good he understood that distinction. Mm -hmm. And it just gets steamrollered over in every mm -hmm. English document that there is. Mm -hmm. It's just made invisible. And I'm really curious about how that happened. Like, I just would really like to know. I'm not, I mean, I, I think it has implications, but I, I'm just really curious. Mm -hmm. The natives just didn't understand, like, English own names. You don't own the land. You just well, and the it. English didn't own it, too. Like, I find that ironic because the king, like, te if like, you're getting technical, mm -hmm. the king owned it. So I think there's such a hypocrisy there of, like, this is mine, I bought it. When and it's another one of those really from... contested spots, right? Because my yeah. guess is that the natives understood it really well. Yeah. And what they kept, kept saying was, no, no, you're not owning the land. You are getting the right to use it. Mm -hmm. And the wars came up because... 
power says I want to own it. Own it. I want yeah. all the rights. Right. right? Yeah. And it becomes this. So that's the cultural. I think there's a cultural, mm -hmm. really powerful cultural di difference mm -hmm. embedded simply in how that was navigated. Yeah, and I, th I think one of those differences is in language, the, the basis of our language. I was talking to somebody in Mashpee, described the uh, English language as noun based. Um, and that was like a fundamental difference in, in just the ba very basic uh, forms of communication, that the English language is more noun-based than, uh, yeah. <laughs> a little bit I can understand from uh, Roger Williams' uh, Key to the Languages of America. Yeah. Uh, if you just take a look at a couple pages, and you know, he'll have this whole sentence, and it'll be one word, mm -hmm. um, you know, that I don't know how the language is constructed, I know nothing about that, mm -hmm. but the idea of noun, adjective, verb kind of thing mm -hmm. that you piece together mm -hmm. in a sentence isn't the way that you have a whole expression for everything. Yeah, and, and the way in which you say something, the emotional side of the, the way in which you say something it is part, part, of the message. part of the message. So uh, I think also like paperwork, you know, that the English brought these paperwork, the idea of these documents. Mm -hmm. Where it's, signing which, your it's, yeah. it, there, there's an authority to the language and to the paperwork in a way that was not in the I think the cultural mind mindset of the people here. I can only imagine yeah. that the native chiefs who signed those things yeah. just thought, well, this is a funny little ritual you do. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like not we that, exchange gifts, you do these right. little marks. Yeah, not that just signing your land away. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. 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 <laughs> I think this is all right. Yeah, we can um, while we're. Figuring this out, we can just keep going <laughs> sure. that way.